Certain air routes hold special status, whether it's because of their unique history, unusual operational requirements, or other challenges. These are must-fly routes for aviation enthusiasts. One of them is Alaska Airlines' regular service from Anchorage to Honolulu. Join us for this six-hour flight over some of the most remote airspace on the planet. Hello, Jet Setters. I'm Jeb Brooks from greenergrass.com, coming to you from Anchorage, I'm about to head to Hawaii. Let's check out one of the most interesting routes in the United States. This is the next leg, and perhaps the most important one, of our wilderness to Waikiki adventure in which we're traveling from Alaska to Hawaii. In this video, you'll see an unusual air route between the two most recent states and learn a little bit of history of Alaska Airlines and the route along the way. This flight covers nearly 2,800 miles and takes almost six hours at a cruising altitude of 37,000 feet. It's longer than flights from the west coast to Hawaii and is more similar in length to a flight from Boston to Shannon, Ireland. The flight is entirely over water, which means our aircraft is going to be ETOPS certified. And that got me thinking, how does that work on this flight? What are the alternate airports? If you know, leave a comment below. Before we could even think about boarding, we had to get negative COVID tests. Now, it's important to highlight the fact that you may not need one anymore. If you're like us and have your vaccine, a test is no longer required to enter Hawaii. That said, these kind of requirements are probably going to remain in place for a long time for travel to certain places around the world, even for vaccinated travelers like us. The good news is that, in most cases, the process is fairly straightforward at this point. I grabbed a quick beard trim while we waited for the results. I've gotten haircuts in airports all over the world, Africa, the Middle East, Asia. It's nice to add Alaska to that list, at least for this beard trim. It feels much better. Now I'm ready for Hawaii. The results were supposed to take about 30 minutes, which meant we had some time to kill. Anchorage makes that easy with lots of informational displays about the 49th state. We'd arrived early just in case the testing took a while, so headed outside to enjoy some fresh air before checking in. So we're negative, we're headed to Honolulu. We are officially ready to go to Hawaii. Just a question for you. Yeah. Um, did you bring any other shirts to wear in Hawaii? What's wrong with this shirt? <laughs> it doesn't scream Hawaii to me. I think it does. Let me know in the comments. Is this Hawaii appropriate? <laughs> After a robust discussion of my wardrobe, we headed back in to check in and go through security. We grabbed lunch here, which is the first restaurant I recall seeing that serves food both airside and landside. I wonder if there are two kitchens. We headed up to the observation area for a nice overview of the airfield. Like most airports these days, Anchorage is fairly busy with passengers coming and going. We went to the Alaska Airlines Lounge. As I've mentioned before, all first-class passengers on Alaska Airlines have access to their clubs. This is unique among U.S. airlines and a welcome feature of this flight. A buffet was available and it included lots of options, including hot soup. An Alaska Airlines signature are self-serve pancakes that are available in their lounges. Coffee but not hot chocolate or mochas were available. I'm guessing that's related to supply chain issues that either have been or will be resolved. There was drip coffee and a soda machine too. There was also a full bar with a sign posted saying passengers should not tip. That's a difference between other U.S. Airlines clubs, which encourage tipping for bartenders. There was plenty of comfortable seating. And naturally, we perched in a spot where we could take advantage of these spectacular views. Anchorage has always been a remarkably busy airport, but over the last 18 months or so, it's become even more so as cargo operations around the world have ramped up and become increasingly reliant upon its strategic location halfway between the United States and Asia. A particular highlight was seeing this 737 decked out in a special livery honoring veterans and service members arrive from its inbound flight. You see, this was the airplane that would take us to paradise. We headed downstairs a bit earlier than we might otherwise because flights to Hawaii require an additional step before boarding. 
Gate agents on all flights to Hawaii currently need to see evidence of a negative COVID test or proof of vaccination. This is still the case even as of the publication of this video. But once you show this documentation, you're given a wristband to wear throughout the flight, allowing you to bypass quarantine at your island destination. It was smooth and easy. Checked in, uh, ready to board, got the wristband. Yeah, I guess we got about 10 minutes until we get on the plane. Boarding began with families traveling with children. In fact, the flight really seemed full of families. While we didn't interview anyone, it looked to us like the flight was evenly split between tourists from Alaska going to Hawaii and those from Hawaii returning home after an Alaskan vacation. This really seems to be a, a leisure route. Alaska Airlines first entered the Hawaiian market in October 2007 when they started offering service from Seattle. But this flight, from Anchorage to Honolulu, was not far behind. Its inaugural flight was on December 9, 2007. It was originally intended to be a seasonal service shuttling Alaskans to tropical paradise in winter, but demand proved strong and it's now offered year-round. Frankly, I was surprised to learn how long this flight has been around, but I guess I'm not the target market. Five hours and 54 minutes. Uh, have a good day. Looks like a really nice trip heading that way. Just wanted to thank you for joining, joining us. It's a pleasure to have you aboard tonight. The flight departed about 4 p.m., but the return was a red eye, and that's why this is the wilderness to Waikiki adventure and not the other way around. Who wants a red eye flight when there's an alternative? We quickly made our way out to the busy runway where we awaited our turn to depart. It's fair to share with you the spark that inspired this flight, and in fact the whole Wilderness to Waikiki adventure. Last November, just after we'd gotten engaged, Suzanne and I sat on a balcony in Maui where we watched the approach into Kahului Airport. Over the course of our stay, we noticed daily flights coming in from Anchorage, which got our gears turning. We both track our flights religiously, and neither one of us had a line linking the last two U.S. states. An idea was born, and it grew into this adventure. Despite our unabashed enthusiasm for aviation in particular and transportation in general, we had no idea that it was possible to fly between these two states. But we should have. They have a lot more in common than you might think. And our own connection between these two states began as we made our way down the runway, destined for a cruising altitude of 37,000 feet on this nearly six-hour flight. Now, back to those similarities. Alaska's and Hawaii stars are relative recent additions to the flag. Alaska became a state on January 3, 1959, and Hawaii followed on August 21st of the same year. They're also both extremes. Alaska is the northernmost state and Hawaii the southernmost. But of course they're massively different and it's the differences I think that speak to the nature of this air link. Despite the fact that our heading would be almost exactly due south, we crossed through two time zones. Anchorage is two hours ahead of Honolulu. And while Alaska is famous for its cold weather and long winters, Hawaii is a tropical paradise, so it makes sense that residents of one might yearn for the other, particularly at certain times of the year. And let's face it, Alaska Airlines is a great airline to provide this air link. I wonder if Hawaiian would ever think about it. I've always had a, a question about Alaska Airlines. Why is it, why is it based in Seattle? I mean, the airline is named for a state more than a thousand miles north. To get to the answer, you've got to look back at the airline's history. But first, we'd reached 10,000 feet, so I pulled out the tray table to get settled in for this fairly long flight. Unfortunately, the table was a bit dirty, but no problem. I used the provided sanitizing wipe. Alaska Airlines does not provide seatback entertainment, so be sure to bring your own device to take advantage of their robust streaming offerings. Power was available at each seat on this flight, and that's vital for one so long. 
I decided on all the president's men as we left the Alaska coastline behind, and just like that, our flight attendant asked for our drinks orders. A gin and tonic for me, and Suzanne opted for the canned Cabernet Sauvignon. Alaska Airlines is rightfully proud of its history, which goes all the way back to 1932, when a pilot painted McGee Airways on the side of his single three-passenger airplane. He offered flights out of Anchorage. Eventually, McGee grew to 22 airplanes. They didn't provide scheduled service, but instead waited for the airplanes to fill up. Once every seat was occupied, off they went. Thankfully, they've graduated from that practice. In the 1940s, charter operations outnumbered scheduled services, and this is really interesting, Alaska became the world's largest charter operator. They even carried food in the Berlin airlift. But the only food I saw getting airlifted on this flight was what we'd pre-ordered through the app. The Huli Huli chicken was the right way to get into the island spirit, and even though it wasn't quite as good as something we might have on the ground, I mean, what, what airline meal really is, we really enjoyed it. A hot meal on an airplane is a treat these days. Now, back to that question of why is Seattle the hub for an airline called Alaska? Okay, remember those charter operations? Well, they continue to grow and require more space than Anchorage could provide. Like any growing company, the airline's management team looked around for somewhere with more space. They connected with the team at Boeing and struck a deal to get additional room at Payne Field. That was where Boeing had most of its operations at the time. Meanwhile, the airline had also been seeking permission to fly between the Pacific Northwest and Alaska. Back then, the government regulated the airlines. And finally, in 1951, Alaska Airlines received permission to offer scheduled services from Anchorage and Fairbanks to Seattle and Portland. As a result of this new scheduled service, the airline moved its headquarters to downtown Seattle. So that meant they had operations at Payne Field and headquarters in Seattle. But the final move occurred in 1963 when the airline moved its maintenance team from Payne Field to Seattle-Tacoma. The airline had fully embraced Seattle as its home. But let's get back to the present day. This is some pretty remote airspace, and my walk through the cabin served as a reminder that the 180 or so people on this airplane were, were pretty far from, well, anybody else. Thanks to the reliable, fast, and consistent Wi-Fi, I was able to keep track of our flight on Flight Radar 24. It's even possible to track your progress inside the Alaska Airlines app. At one point, it looked like a passing A350 might be visible from our side of the plane. I locked my eyes out the window and saw nothing. Alaska Airlines does a really nice job with special liveries on their aircraft. As I mentioned before, this is one called Honoring Those Who Serve. At the front of the cabin, there's a plaque talking about the meaning behind the livery. And in each seat back, there's a brochure explaining the significance of the livery. I'll provide a link to an Alaska Airlines website with details about the symbology on this livery. Just check the description below. When our lead flight attendant noticed me reading that plaque, she found an extra copy of the brochure for me to take home. How cool is that? Before long, the sun set, our cabin went dark, Oahu appeared, and we began our final approach into Honolulu. Overall, this was a great flight. And as aviation enthusiasts, it was fantastic to add this unique air route to our maps. And to do it on such a special liveried airplane was an added bonus. Now, I'd like to step away from the Jeb score approach for this flight and instead offer, well, let's call it a greener grass editorial, if you don't mind. All I see in the news these days about aviation is stories about passengers causing disruptions or hours spent on hold, flights getting canceled, employee shortages, so much negativity. And that means the excellent service that so many airline employees continue to provide 
gets lost. For example, how about that flight attendant who gave me the brochure? Or what about the bartender in the lounge who served drinks with a smile and no expectation of a tip? That's what I like to call plus one service. It's just that little bit extra, like a pilot saying goodbye to passengers as they deplane, or a flight attendant thanking a passenger for her loyalty, a gate agent offering a little bit of extra help to a confused customer. Look, the minimum commitment of an airline is to get you safely from one place to another. In fact, according to their contracts of carriage, that's all they have to provide. But airlines like Alaska encourage their employees to add that little bit extra, that plus one to the experience. I know the last 18 months or so have been hard on everyone, particularly airline employees. And I can't begin to express my gratitude to each of you who have worked hard through these difficult times to keep us moving. Now I just hope we can eventually return to this kind of customer-focused attention as the world continues to slowly open up. Again, thanks to everyone in the industry who continues to work hard to remain customer-focused, even in these difficult times. Between now and the next time, see in the sky. <laughs>